So uh, now we are holding the 19th meeting within the framework of the series of workshops, Contemporary Area Studies. Uh, this is a project of School of International Regional Studies of the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs of the HEC University. And our today meeting will be the last one in this season. It's one more time a great event. Our discussion will be devoted to the Russian-Iranian cooperation in Middle East and North Africa. Of course, Iran-Russia relations have reached an unprecedented peak fueled by military cooperation in Syria, a shared vision of, uh, vision of global uh, order and mutual criticism of Western policy in the Middle East. Tehran is useful ally to Moscow in a highly unstable region. Moscow offers Tehran a critical means. Uh, Moscow offers Tehran a critical means of protecting its regional security interests. But despite this, there are many contradictions between the countries, as I understand, that could become an obstacle to cooperation, such as Moscow relations with Israel, the difference in understanding of the post-conflict settlement in Syria, and now the Libyan crisis may be seen here. So I hope we will have enough time to discuss it uh, with our key speaker, Gönche, uh, Dr. Gönche Tazmini, visiting fellow at the Middle East Center, London School of Economics, formerly an associate member at the Center for Iranian Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, where she was Iran Heritage Foundation Fellow. Gönche Hanum conducts research on Iran-related themes as a British Academy grant, grant holder. She's currently researching Iranian-Russian alignment in the Middle East, has authored books, uh, articles, and opinion piece on a broad range of Iran-related themes. themes. Uh, she frequently participates in workshops and roundtables and regularly engages with international media. And Che Hanum also works on consultancy, uh, consultancy projects, uh, bridging the theory practice gap by providing expertise to the wider non-academic community. Uh, online with us also will be Dr. Vera Vishnikova, the head of the School of International Regional Studies of the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs, of the HEC University. Now I want to give floor to our uh, head and organizer of this event, Dr. Verushnikova, the floor is yours for your welcoming speech, please. Yes, thank you very much, Murat. And firstly, I extend to, all, uh, to you all our warmest welcome, especially to Dr. Tazmini, who generously agreed to, uh, to take part in our seminar. It's a great pleasure for us uh, to meet such uh, an interesting speaker. Thank you. I would like to emphasize that the Russian Iranian cooperation is one of the strategic fields in Russia, not only on the government level, but also on the level of education research. Our School of International Regional Studies has developed strong cooperation with uh, multilateral ties uh, with the Tigran University, and we are actively involved in the different research projects for academic experts and uh, students. We have already established an international work group with students from Iran, and in the September 2020, we will start the first student project focused on bilateral economic cooperation. It would be a great pleasure for us if uh, you, Dr. Tasmini, will join to our work. And uh, I think that um, I want to I want to say uh, thank you, our dear colleagues and special guests, that uh, you have found the time to be with us today. I believe we will uh, get to know a lot of interesting facts from our speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vishnikova. But before we start, I also want to introduce you our special guest. It will be Andrei Vaklanov, head of the Middle East and North Africa Studies section of the School of International Regional Studies of the HEC uh, University. Uh, he's also head of International Affairs Department at the Federation Council of Russian Federal Assembly, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary, and Deputy Chairman of the Board of Association of Russian Diplomats. Uh, then it will be Farhat Ibrahimov, research, researcher at the UNESCO Chair, State University of Management. Uh, also our dear guest Nikita Smagin, he is a TASS news agency correspondent in Iran, non-resident expert at the R Russian International Affairs Council. And finally, Adlan Margoyev, uh, he's a best friend of mine, junior researcher at the Center for Middle East Studies, Institute for International Studies, Gimo University. Dear colleagues, thank you to be with us. Thank you for the, uh, accepting our invitation. And now, Dr. Gonche, uh, it's time for your speech. One more time, thank you for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours, please. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Vera, Dr. Murad. It's a pleasure um, to have the opportunity to present this online uh, virtual lecture. Um, and thank you so much for joining fellow colleagues. Um, so the discussion um, will be framed around the parameters of Russian-Iranian partnership and a focus on how this partnership manifests in different zones in the Middle East. So I'll begin my discussion with a quote by Dostoevsky, who wrote that Russia was a slave in Europe, but a master in Asia. You may have heard of this quote before. It's been quoted before by Dominic Levin in his Dilemmas of Empire. But I found that the prevailing view that the Kremlin instrumentalizes Tehran as a provisional counterweight to balance its relations with the US or um, Europe would suggest that this is not a quote from a bygone era. Um, so one common argument um, is that Iran is being used as a leverage um, against the US, against Europe, and that it is a self-perceived superpower that views itself really on par with the US and not with Iran. And the premise of this argument is that the degree of expansion and contraction um, of Russian-Iranian cooperation is really conditioned and constrained by Russia's relations with the US and whether relations are amicable or hostile at the, at the time. And the fact is that relations between Russia and Iran have been ambiguous and inconsistent, um, wavering um, between cooperation, friction, contention, there are, there are asymmetries, there are common views, um, but there's really a, a lot of literature out there asking whether these two states are partners, whether they're rivals, adversaries, competitors, and there's really no shortage. I mean, it's almost like a constant production line uh, of articles asking this, this perennial question. Um, the question is whether, is Iran a pawn? Is it, is it a bargaining chip? Um, does Iran have any agency in this partnership given um, that Russia is uh, the, uh, the stronger power in the relationship, power differential is in favor of Russia. Does Iran um, resent Russia? The, does is popular opinion against Russia? Do, how do the elite perceive um, Russian policies? Um, and also vice versa, how does the Russian public perceive Iran? Do they perceive Iranians, um, Iran as an ally? Um, and so there's, there's a constant interrogation of the fabric, the nature of this partnership. Um, and indeed, we've seen this, this partnership characterizes everything from a, a random partnership uh, to a tactical entente, a, a circumstantial uh, alliance. And, and one recent one um, that I read, which was an oscillating relationship, which I found quite creative. Um, so the fact that this question is a recurring one suggests that the question is open-ended, it's inconclusive. And I think that what really complicates um, matters is the methodological formula of these studies, which usually is limited to a balance sheet of areas of cooperation and areas of contention. Um, what I say is that we really can't calibrate Moscow-Tehran relations based on the pattern of engagement interaction that the two have had over the past two decades, um, if we're just going to rely on evidence such as um, delays in the delivery of the S300s or um, you know, the delays in the, in the, in the Boucher power plant, uh, the light water reactor um, construction. So what I would like to do is to dig deeper and to understand why it is that despite clashes, these two countries remain aligned. Um, one of the problems that I find in the literature that I've gone through is that many of these studies are compiled in uh, policy centers or think tanks that have their own political agendas, they're partisan. And with Trump's maximum pressure campaign against Iran, I can, I've noticed an increased tendency to accentuate incompatibilities between Moscow and Tehran. Uh, to suggest that Iran is entirely isolated, that it has no partners, and that the pressure is, is actually working, um, and it's been cut off from the rest of the international system. And we see the literature replete with references to a history of mistrust between the two states, 
going all the way back to the 19th century, the Treaty of Golestan, Treaty of Turkmenchai, um, in order to emphasize the volatility of this partnership and to suggest that Russia is a fickle partner and that likewise, Iran is also um, opportunistic as well and that, that it's really a partnership built on sand, as they say. And of course, the emphasis uh, again is on Russia's courtship of Israel, Iran's adversary, um, or focus on the oil diplomacy uh, with Saudi Arabia last year, um, Russia's multi-billion dollar contracts, uh, energy defense, trade with the Arab monarchies that are commonly cited as evidence that Russia is duplicitous and it's gonna turn its back on Iran at any moment. And for example, we, as, as one of uh, our colleagues mentioned, um, in post-war uh, Syria, there's a lot of speculation right now that Russia and Iran are going to clash, ultimately, that this um, marriage of convenience is going to, going to become inconvenient all of a sudden in post-conflict Syria, with issues of a military reform, uh, reconstruction uh, projects and investment opportunities, and also the vision of a post-conflict Syrian governance. And of course, there will be clashes, and there's a, a, these points are all valid, um, but we still see a common thread that binds these two countries, despite these um, asymmetries in their policies and in their outlook. Uh, now, my research has shown that despite these um, colliding geostrategic and geoeconomic uh, pathways, the pattern of engagement suggests that this partnership is likely to be an enduring feature of the Middle East and political landscape. And of course, this is important because Russia right now has um, you know, this talk of the Russian resurgence in the Middle East. Russia is keen to portray itself as an arbiter, um, an international broker between feuding parties, uh, a reliable mediator. So it's keen on presenting itself as um, in a, in a role that is more uh, constructive, um, and juxtaposing that against the US role, which has created um, instability. So Russia has sought to position itself as this co-manager of international affairs in the Middle East. So uh, we can see its growing footprint in the region. And of course, with Iran, we know that its regional, its carefully calibrated regional bulwark really is Part of its security doctrine, its military doctrine, it's part of its national narrative, it is all based on its um, perceptions of, of, of security threats. So these two countries are relevant um, and they are permanent fixtures on this landscape. So there is an importance in understanding how far, um, what the constraints of this partnership is, how it can be constructive in different areas, um, and how 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 much the international community can really rely on these two being a constant um, variable in the in the region and so what i have done in my research is i've what i've tried to cast a wider net and identify what this connective tissue is between these two states and what it is that binds these two two countries together and what i've come up with is the idea of course that we are very familiar with which is that both have a very similar geopolitical um, worldview, a very similar narrative of the world order. And that is shaped by cultural civilizational peculiarities, normative values. Um, and part of the research that I've done is this similar discursive um, history or genealogy with the West, whether it's been through modernization campaigns in the past, uh, whether it's been um, in the Soviet days or in the construction of an Islamic Republic, whether it's been anti-Western, whether it's been pro-Western, there's always a tension in the history, in the dialectic between Russia and Iran and the West. So this is almost part and parcel of this fabric that, um, that informs this, these normative values. So one of the tasks of my research has been to understand that we have this um, connective tissue and what this tish connective tissue suggests is that there are deeper patterns of convergence and that there's almost like two layers. We've got their real politic interests at the top where they might clash, but at the bottom we've got on another plane, they've got these deeper patterns of convergence 
which I will explain to you. But before I do that, one of the things that I've been doing at uh, the Middle East Center is trying to decipher the correct terminology in describing this partnership. And I think that's a very important task because some people often confuse uh, Russian-Iranian alignment thinking that, well, it's really an alliance or it's a bloc or it's a um, coalition. It's, so the terminology is always very shaky. And what that does is create even more confusion about how far Russia would go, for example, if it was, if in the event of a US attack on Iran, would Russia come to Iran's rescue? Um, what would happen if the reverse were to happen if relations between Russia and the US became more amicable? Would it, how would Iran feature in that case? Uh, would, they, would they gang up on Iran? So, I mean, there's lots of questions that transpire from the lack of a correct, accurate terminology to apply. And what I have done is, so on the one hand, we've got this uh, argument that Iran is a provisional counterweight and that it has no agency. Um, and it's just a regional, um, it's a pawn on this regional chessboard. But then on the other hand, we had alarms raised when, um, for the first time in, since the Iranian revolution in 2016, um, Russian, the Russian Air Force launched a fleet of bombers from the Shahid Moja Air Base in Iran. Um, and so that was hinting deeper military cooperation and then everybody got all concerned about that. Um, and Shahid Moja Air Base is, is near the, the western city of um, Hamadan. And this was to bomb targets in Syria. Um, there was also similar consternation about this budding uh, military alliance in 2019. And this was when Russia, along with China, uh, carried out naval drills in the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean. So this just demonstrates how challenging it really is to demarcate the boundaries of, of Moscow-Tehran relations. We also have the rhetoric, which is quite fiery and incendiary, particularly when, for example, Soleimani was assassinated, or these days with the IAEA resolution being passed, um, uh, or not being passed, rather, being drafted by the Europeans and, and the rather vo uh, vociferous response that we see from the Russian foreign minister, or when it comes to the United States potentially enact enacting the snapback mechanism. You know, there's no um, ceremony when it comes to the language that is used. You know, that the, the United States is ridiculous, that it doesn't have any sense of proportion, and that it's pretty much delusional, I think, were the words that we use. Um, by Russian um, authorities or of, um, officials um, to describe this, this idea. So that creates cause for alarm. Uh, well then, does this mean that Russia would step in? Now, this has been the challenge of conceptualizing this partnership because of this inaccurate terminology. So in the international relations, we have the term alliance thrown around all the time. And this has been the case with Russia and Iran. And those policy papers or reports that are determined to paint the picture of two recalcitrant countries um, pursuing a very nefarious regional agenda. They want, to, um, they want to undo the international order. They want to clash with the United States. So all of these alarmist narratives always use the word alliance. And what we see from theorists, um, experts on, on international relations and experts on um, alliances and coalitions is that really the, these two countries have nothing to do with the typical military alliance paradigm um, or the coalitions of the willing or the security uh, communities or even strategic partnerships in terms of exact um, definitions. And the idea is that we should begin by using a more accurate descriptor, which is the term alignment. And alignment is closer um, in line with the contemporary security environment, which is characterized by multiple forms of alignment, and not just alliances in their many guises. So, um, in fact, I presented some of this research at the Middle East Center, and our director mentioned the expression dynamic alignment, which I found was very useful in describing this partnership. Um, and I'll explain to you why uh, alignment is a better uh, phrase to use or um, a descriptor. So um, if we think of um, Glenn Snyder's definition of alliance, 
Snyder specifies that alliances are formal associations of states for the use or non-use of military force in spe specified circumstances against states outside their own membership. Now, Russian and Iranian cooperation is not defined militarily. It is not based on a pact or formal pledge to deploy military force or military resources against a specific state or states in any specific, in any specified circumstances. It's accurate, more accurate to say they're aligned, which means that they have a shared agreement or understanding on one or more significant issues. And this is the definition um, that was offered by Glenn Snyder. Um, and also by, I can give the names of these um, theorists later because they are very useful. Um, but alignment, um, this alignment was made clear during the second Iran-Russia Joint Supreme Committee for parliamentary cooperation when Majlis Speaker, well then Majlis Speaker Ali Larajani called for expanded ties between the two states in order to counter international dictatorship. While State Duma Chief uh, Volodin expressed that Iran and Russia are two partners that are committed to non-interference in each other's affairs. So that really in a nutshell captured the scope of this partnership. And so I think it's a useful definition and that it gives a proper calibration of their, um, of their um, interactions, which are characterized by placing a premium on state sovereignty, denouncing Western interventionism, color or democracy promotion agendas or revolution, seeing them as a way for the Atlantic ideological uh, power uh, system to advance the self-interest um, influence and security of Western states. And Russia's engagement with Iran is based on more elastic and versatile constellations of security alignments, such as the SCO, or for example, the Eurasian Economic, uh, the e EUEA, um, or I don't know if I said that properly, but different sorts of regional collective organizations and not so much on the military aspect. Um, so we've also seen um, after, for example, Soleimani's assassination, um, Lavrov reiterated that Moscow uh, supported full membership of Iran into the Eurasian security bloc. And speaking at a geopolitics forum in New Delhi, he noted that Iran's an observer, but we were going to do everything to support full membership. So you can see a correlation between, you know, Western or, Euro or American outbursts and uh, more confrontational um, measures and then support that comes from Russia's side. But again, it's not militarily defined. It's based on a mutual understanding of the way they see the world. And that brings me to the deeper patterns of convergence between the Kremlin and Tehran. So I argue that, well, I and others argue that it's too simplistic to think that Russia and Iran are united in this, in their revanchist foreign policy goals and that Iran's just a, a, a regional, a pawn in this regional calculus. There's a long-standing failure to appreciate the multiple influences on Russian and Iranian foreign policy and how they play out in different political theaters. What I have um, gathered is that the post-Cold War order that saw American hegemonic posturing has rendered this strategic alignment between Moscow and Tehran somewhat inevitable. Um, Russia and Iran are fundamentally aligned in the sense that they are both anti-hegemonic and they both oppose the idea that a single state or a single constellation of states and order is able to impose a particular set of normative values and power structures as universal. And this is the crux of, of my argument, which is that these, these two countries are united in the sense that they both subscribe to the idea of sovereign internationalism, they both reject the idea of liberal, liberal interventionism. And this, their partnership is in, embedded in this shared geopolitical worldview that's shaped by this um, perception that really the Western uh, international system, international order, Western um, defined international order clashes and is there to undermine their own. Um, and so Russian revolutionary, the Iranian revolutionary elite, along with their Kremlin counterparts, believe that these prevailing laws and norms are really there to perpetuate the hegemony of Western powers. And this is that connective tissue that I talk about. And this is the premium that they've placed um, when it comes to their partnership. Now, um, I'm not gonna get into the, the history of it, but 
it's suffice it to say that from I use the timeline beginning from 1991 when Russia and the West ended the Cold War and then entered the era of cold peace. Now I use this this time frame to show that Russia's place in the international order had a lot to do with it aligning with Iran. Um, and really what we had was the failure of Western security organizations to transcend Cold War institutions and norms. And instead of uh, reaching out to Russia that has showed an, showed an openness to adapting to Western norms and institutions, um, instead what we saw was that the West decided to enlarge rather than to integrate. What we had was uh, NATO and the EU seeing, thing, seeing matters in terms of enlargement of their own existing structures and not as something uh, new to be created in dialogue uh, with Russia. So from the perspective of, of Western powers, it was the reverse. It was Russia that was unwilling to jettison its imperial mindset and that it was Russia's fault to begin with. And so what we had was Russia's view that what we, we should have, the, the West should have developed a strategic concept that could manage differences between the West, between Europe and Russia um, within an emerging multipolar world and not this uni, unipolar world, this polycentric world that Russia envisions. And this is where we have convergence with Iran. Iran is a country that's been contained by sanctions, diplomatic isolation, threats of military action and regime overthrow efforts. Iran's been labeled everything from a pariah to a rogue state uh, on an axis of evil. And so Iran has this deep-seated existential fear. And this fear is warranted, considering how close the US and Iran came to the brink of war just earlier this year, um, last year with the tanker and drone crisis, and the, the, as I mentioned, the, the Soleimani debacle. So like um, their Kremlin counterparts, the Islamic Republic doesn't fit neatly within the rubric of the existing political categories. And so this mindset really informs Iran's foreign policy culture, its narratives, and its strategic preferences, which at this point are systemic, they're institutionalized, and they're cultural. Now, while Russia was spared the label of pariah, the US national security strategy document of December 2018 ranked Russia alongside the rogue powers of Iran and North Korea and transnational threat organizations, particularly jihadist groups. The previous edition that was actually um, released under Obama listed Russia alongside threats such as the Ebola virus and ISIS. So, I mean, these days it would probably wouldn't be Ebola, it would probably be COVID-19, but what I'm trying to say is that both, that both these countries are outsiders and they're un unaccommodated in the ex existing world order. Both of these states are aligned in that they have the same vision, pluralistic vision of what the international system should be. And this is why they've worked together to foster or to build alternative, integrative uh, networks, multilateral um, institutions on, on a regional level. As I mentioned, the EA, EU, in Russia's case, BRICS, and the SCO. So a sort of non-Western alliance system that is anti-hegemonic and a counterweight to US polarity. And this is the, this is the common denominator that is, is, is always present no matter which area we look at and, and no matter how um, heated the tension can become between Russia and Iran. There have been lots of words that have been thrown around. I mean, it was just a year ago, I think it was when uh, President Putin said, well, it, Russia is not a fire brigade. We're not here just to put out all the fires. Um, and so there are limits to this partnership. But what I argue is that it's this um, mindset that both of these countries have that keeps them uh, together. And, and, um, and it's this, this vision of a world order that they both subscribe to, this polycentric worldview. I mean, I just remembered that um, a scholar called Trini Flockhart, she, uh, talks about a, a multi-ordered world in which there are several inter-orders inter nestled within this, under this umbrella. And um, Russia, along with China and Iran, can be considered one of these inter-orders within this multi-order world. And the idea isn't to, uh, you know, rival the US. It's simply 
to create um, it's it's to create other structures with their own unique um, norms, institutions, values that don't necessarily challenge the United States or the West, but they coexist, and that's been the idea all along. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there because I think we have a lot to talk about in terms of particular questions and different areas that we can expand on, and I don't want to tire you too much. So, do you agree, Dr. Mirad, that we should stop here? Uh, yes, uh, I should mention that I'm not a doctor yet, unfortunately, but I hope in the future. <laughs> Just more right for you. Uh, I think it's okay, as you want. Uh, your lecture and speech was so interesting. I don't think that it's someone boring. Uh, now I also uh, want to welcome Andrei Baklanov, Professor Baklanov. Uh, thank you to join us. And as I see today with us also Alexei Halebnikov, he's also expert of Russian International Affairs Council. Nice to meet you, Alexei. So now, uh, dear colleagues, uh, firstly, I will provide uh, floor to our special guest for some comments. Uh, and after that, it will be question from the side of our participants. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, our guests, I mean experts, if you have a question or comments, please, uh, you can turn on your microphone and comment it, or maybe you have some questions. So if there is no question, I just want to mention that, uh, as Gyan uh, Chekhanum said, it seems to me that uh, like Russia and Iran, it's like bad guys uh, in international community. Uh, just a minute. So, Professor Baklanov, maybe you have, uh, Nikita, you have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, I, I just, uh, the best thing I want to say that, uh, it's uh, very interesting uh, to see these things about the, uh, uh, you know that usually when we're trying to read, we, we met analytics, uh, especially in Russian, but also in English, usually analytics doesn't uh, pay attention to theory much. And it's great that uh, Dr. Tasmini tries to use some theoretical models to, to explain these things. Uh, it's very useful and thanks for this amazing job. Uh, I want to, well, to, to ask this thing, that when you're building this uh, theoretical model, uh, am I right that you're trying to use the, something like a billiard ball metaphor, that you don't, for you it's not important what's happening inside the country, so, uh, and the, the main thing is uh, how the country is acting on international relations. I'm asking this because for example, you are saying that uh, one of the main things that, uh, that is common uh, between Russia and Iran is the, um, another way of like the common uh, perception of international relation. Uh, but for example, when I'm coming to you know that some uh, meetings with people from Beitar uh, Bay, from from the office of the Khamenei. Uh, they speak, some of them speak fluent Arabic, some of them just speak in Arabic, but they're, they're making their you know, statements in Arabic, not in English. And these things, you know, when you're trying to analyze how people think here, and you know, it's very difficult because um, it's not difficult, it's, it's not easy to, to talk with uh, Khamenei, unfortunately. Uh, but still, I think that their view of international relations, especially, I mean, the um, so the, the um, Khamenei and people who are, uh, support him, who are around him, their view of international relations is just differs a lot from, uh, from, from Russians, from uh, people in China, from wherever. So this is the point. So is it really important for you what people think inside the country, what's going on, going on inside the country, or you're just analyzing it just That's like very good question. I mean, the framework that I've, I've, I've um, identified or, or a paradigm, it's a general one. I mean, in the sense that I think these structures are always going to be in place, which is this particular vision of the world order. And the only thing that can really shake this decisively would be if relations between Russia and the US or relations between Iran and the US were to change. Only then would we see a true shift or would we see that this structure would start to, to, to move a bit and get shaky? Um, so 
what you've just described, you know, the Arab speaking of the, of the Beit Rahbari, I would look at that as, um, as this kind of conservative wave that has, is now very firmly in place in Iran, where we've got nowadays, we have uh, conservatives that are heading the parliament and the judiciary. So I'm speaking about Raisi and Ali uh, and, and, and Raisi. And this definite shift pivot towards a conservative uh, camp, uh, hardline or principalist, or there was another word, I don't remember what it was, but um, this kind of hardline position. Um, of course, as a result of the failure of the, well, the, what we saw with the JCPOA, unfortunately being reneged, and then the uh, host of penalties and sanctions that were reimposed. So I think that, I think that, we're looking at domestic politics, and the domestic politics suggests more conservatism. More conservatism because more of a security threat that is being perceived because of the, let's say, the possibility of snapback, the sanctions, the fall in oil prices, uh, the effect of the pandemic. So I think that you have this kind of hardening domestically, but that that doesn't really impinge on that structure that I've described because. If, if we look at half of the statements that come out of Iran, there are references to global arrogance and to hypocrisy. I mean, you open the Tehran Times, you'll, I can guarantee you that you'll see those, those two expressions. Uh, so that is where these two are, are aligned, because it's that imperialist mindset, it is that, uh, which, which is as part of the revolutionary narrative, which was based on, you know, the idea that, um, that it was about empowering the third world um, and fighting global arrogance. So I think there's a, there's a I, I don't necessarily think that they're in contradiction to each other, if I'm answering you correctly. I just think that that particular scenario that you've described is the domestic situation right now, which is more hardline, uh, more cautious, l less open to dialogue or any sort of rapprochement or any sort of renegotiation of anything. I think that's that. Um, but I don't see that countering the, the structure that I've described. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Adlan, I see your hands, please. The floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my question might depart from this theoretic framework, but I would love to dig deeper into the Iranian elites. Um, you just mentioned the general uh, structure and you know the way uh, the Iranian elites are described in media both inside Iran and outside Iran the fundamentalists or principalists and conservatives in as one uh, part and the other one is uh, reformists um, would you offer an alternative more detailed structure of the Iranian elites and uh, how would you picture their perception of Russia you, whether they are homogenous in terms of how they view uh, Russia and the engagement, the recent engagement of Iran with our country, or there are some caveats uh, that are pertaining to, pertaining to specific groups of influence, whether that be people from uh, the establishment, from uh, those who are close to the supreme leader, or moderates, or you know uh, any details that you could offer would uh, greatly improve our understanding of internal structure of Iranian elites rather than just simply dividing them into two uh, groups and uh, saying that these are more in favor of Russia and the others are not. So I would welcome your comments on that. Absolutely, that's a very good question. And, and yeah, it's not good to bulk every, every, all the elites together and to you know, just make a wholesale statement about their perceptions of Russia. But the reality is that within the Iranian national psyche, there is definitely a sense of mistrust when it comes to Russian policies. And that, of course, is informed by this history, um, this checkered past. But the reality is that Iran cannot afford to indulge in resentment. It's a luxury to think that at this stage, where it's been isolated, that it can actually think about resentment or any idealistic uh, vision of how its partnerships should be in the world. It's really about survival. So even though the average person might have a, have a memory that they've read in their history books about you know, the different kinds of um, um, you know, in, 
I won't get into it, it's too, in, too much to detail, I don't want to give you a history lesson, but Russia's uh, more nefarious role in Iran's history in the 19th century or even early 20th century. Um, so if we look at the moderates and the reformists, they're usually very pro-Western, usually. This was before the JCPOA got reneged. They still had hope that they could engage in a dialogue with the West and that ultimately they would turn to their Western partners to engage in trade, um, business deals. Um, I mean, that was the ideal. Western products, Western technology, um, Western goods in terms of quality, in terms of sophistication, are always prized over the Russian. And that's a fact. But Iran, and, and that is what they had banked on. The reformists had hoped that by brokering this watershed deal, that they would prove the conservatives that no, you know, we have uh, extended, they've extended, they've, they've reached out and accepted our olive branch. Uh, unfortunately, that's not what happened. You know, it was unceremoniously destroyed by Trump. And that, that has created this big shift. And that shift isn't just amongst the, uh, and with that shift comes greater reliance on Russia. And if we look at the only country that has spoken out in defense of, of Iran, along with China, but then China is again, its relationship with Iran is very much conditioned and constrained by its relationship with the US and its trade wars and its you know, phase one, phase different phases of its trade agreements. But it's only been Russia that has um, acted as a bulwark against Iran's isolation. It has just recently, I mean, with the, uh, it's just, spoken out against the decision to uh, enact this dispute mechanism resolution, the snapback. Um, as I said, they were, the, the, the Russians were very vocal about it, very vociferous. And so they're the only ones that have vetoed uh, resolutions uh, all along. I mean, there was a stage when um, Medvedev was president, when there was hope that, he, that, that there, there was going to be a, a warming up of relations with Russia. But then again, when that stopped, Iran, uh, Russia resumed the sale of, uh, of, the, of the service to air missiles, the S-300s in 2015. So, you know, that was temporary. And, and Iran has had to rely because it has more foes than friends in the region. And Russia's balancing act is something that it can rely on. It knows that Russia is not going to all of a sudden align with Israel one day or Saudi Arabia or the UAE and just forget about Iran. There's a certain consistency in, in even the inconsistency is, is, is consistent. So what I would say is that um, the moderates being more, giving more um, uh, credence or having more hope in the West is, is part of their whole um, raison d'etre, which is to engage in dialogue, hopefully rapprochement. So they're not going to have such a black and white vision uh, that the hardliners will have. The hardliners are simply informed by um, security issues. They want to develop Iran's uh, deterrent power, um, and that's it. So they, they are well aware of the history of mistrust, and they are very well aware that Russia picks and chooses when it's to its advantage. But 90% of the time, it's been working towards Iran's advantage. Because at the end, there's one other common feature, which is that the US will, that the Russia will never really pivot towards the US. And why is that? Because there's a fundamental, um, in order for the US to, Russia to pivot towards the US, there would have to be a fundamental reconstitution um, of US foreign policy towards Russia. Um, and what we have is what I've just described, this fundamental disjuncture between how the US and Russia perceives the post-Cold War order. Um, for Russia to forsake Iran, the US would have to um, deliver huge concessions. Namely, it would have to uh, ease the sanctions that came about after the Crimea-Ukraine debacle. It would have to permanently shelve NATO expansion to the borders, to Russia's backyard. Um, and it would also have to turn a, sort of a blind eye to, to Russia's um, aspirations in, in the form of Soviet space, whatever that aspiration is, whether it's even just cultural influence. Uh, and so that's never going to happen. Well, not never going to happen, but it's highly unlikely that that's going to happen. It's as unlikely as Iran and the US having a detente. So we can pretty much count on this partnership being stable based on these extrinsic factors.
So I hope that answers your question. But in the public, there, there, I did read a report that when there were the protests in 2009 uh, disputing um, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's re-election, re um, there were rumors or there, was, there were accounts that the public was shouting Magbad Russia, which is death to Russia, and they're you know, incriminating Russia. And that was because Russia was the first country, one of the first countries to accept Ahmadinejad as president. And so the view is that it's um, backstabbing, authoritarian, dictate, dictatorial, and it supports the status quo, uh, which they perceive is you know, non-democratic. But in Russia's case, it's respecting state sovereignty. It's respecting the boundaries and the domestic affairs of other countries, that's its policy. But then again, the average Iranian who was you know, in the green movement won't see it that way. We'll see you know, either you're with us or you're against us kind of mentality. And on the other hand, we should also look at how Russia perceives Iran. Uh, the 2016 Levada polls suggest that only 2% of Russians perceive Iran as an ally. So mistrust is there, but I think that they, that's why they're such strange bedfellows, because you, you just, they're not natural allies, but they've had to because of the circumstances and because of this, this um, similar narrative that I've described. Sorry, that's a really long answer to your question. <laughs> no, I think it's, it was great. Uh, great. And really, the main tricky point and milestone of Russian-Iranian relations, as I uh, before, uh, when I was in Iran, I also listened from some Iranian people that Russia history show us that Russia is not our friend, and it's sometimes it's really so pity. But I hope uh, our countries should focus on current situation and try to continue and cooperate. So uh, now, as I see, we have one more question from our expert, Farhat Ibrahimov. Please, Farhat. Uh, yes, uh, Murat, uh, thank you very much. Uh, dear Gyan Chahanu, thank you very much. For, I'm grateful for, to you for so uh, interesting presentation. So I have a question. Uh, what uh, do you think about uh, International North-South North uh, Transport Corridor project? Uh, could we achieve uh, any result? real result and uh, will it straighten russia iran cooperation thank you sorry i didn't hear the last part uh will it threaten uh, uh, russia, iran cooperation. Cooperation. would it threaten yes threaten russia, iran cooperation okay will it threaten russian iranian cooperation strengthen i think sorry, strengthen. sorry to interrupt that's why i, yeah. I can't get that hopefully thank you <laughs> um right with the um I would say that any sort of regional, whether it's a pipeline, whether it's a, let's just say whatever it has to do with energy resources, any sort of alternative regional integrative or collective program is of interest to, to Iran. Because Iran is banking on the idea that these sanctions are either going to be in place or maybe they'll just be reimposed with the, um, eventually. Uh, even if Trump stays in power, um, the idea is that, you know, these sanctions are going to be in place. The European Union has not been able to um, deliver on its Instex uh, alternative payment uh, vehicle. I mean, it had one transaction, which it did. Um, but then again, I mean, it wasn't something that they can really rely on. They are now, um, I think it was like the last assessment was there was eight, I think this was a study done by... Um, which was that it was Iran's uh, sales um, of oil and, and related oil products was eight, it was almost nine million dollars in 19, 20, between 2020, 2019 and 2020. And that that's down from a peak of 119 billion uh, less than a decade ago. So we have this huge um, shift to non-oil uh, non -oil economy. Um, along with the Chinese initiative, like the Belt and Road Initiative, or um, all of these different programs are all ways to fortify the non-European, non non-Western, non-US um, partnerships, which is reducing reliance on the whims on the West. So I think that that is, again, part of that overall uh, overarching principle that, and it, it, the same thing applies with the Caspian Sea, the, the legal, the convention um, on the, the legal convention on the Caspian Sea that was uh, drafted a couple of years ago, I think, um, 
to many it was uh, Iran conceding a lot. It was, Iran was giving away a lot because of the seabed, whether the Caspian Sea is a lake or it's a seabed. And there was a lot of contestation domestically that Iran was giving a lot away. But the fact is that a lot of the stipulations there, for example, the fact that there couldn't be a foreign military power present, um, and that was one of the main stipulations, was of interest to Iran because it, was, it, it would cater to Iran's security concerns, or that it was creating an alternative arrangement. So yes, I think um, the North-South Corridor, anything similar to that, to Iran is really creating a counterweight to the isolation that it has. And most certainly I would say that anything that has no United States involvement is of interest to Iran. Thank you so much. Uh, dear colleague Saleh and Naim, I see your hands, but before uh, I give the floor, the floor, I want to ask maybe Professor Baklanov uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, I do, do, do have here, really. Uh, <clears throat> of course, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Tasmimi for a very interesting presentation. We are happy to have you here. And uh, my question deals uh, with the following. You know, we have uh, uh, a few very important parallel factors uh, when we are analyzing Russian-Iranian relations. One of these uh, parallel uh, track or uh, parallel factor, it's uh, the relationship between Iranian side and uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, in many uh, things and uh, many uh, speeches uh, we uh, hear from uh, Iran, we feel uh, some anti-American accent, anti-American accent. Well, uh, my question is, uh, well, to which uh, extent this uh, anti-Americanism uh, is uh, the manifestation of, uh, of the substance of uh, the Iranian identity, Iranian policy? Or it might be something else, maybe it's just the reaction uh, of uh, Iran to stern American anti-Iranian policy, uh, the policy, uh, well, uh, which deals um, uh, with uh, unfriendly actions, uh, with sanctions, etc., etc., etc. What's the relationship between the internal factor and uh, the uh, the uh, the attitude of the Iranians? Uh, uh, which is the result of the American policy. What you have uh, uh, to say, uh, well, in, in, this, uh, in this regard. It's a, it's a very balanced uh, issue and we would like to know your specific uh, uh, estimation uh, of this, uh, of this uh, feature of uh, the uh, Iranian policy. Oh, the question is, uh, I, I, I would frame it, is, is, this, is there an anti-Americanism that's inherent within the Iranian national psyche or is it, um, is it something that the Iranian elite harbor? Is it, um, well, let's not forget that if we divide, if we divide the, the, the people and the elite and the elite that is very much informed by the revolutionary narrative, if we um, separate the two, well, Iran's revolutionary narrative is informed by anti-Americanism. And that's why we had the hostage takeover. Um, and really the anti-Americanism is the buildup of many, many years of resentment and a lot of historical tit for tat, beginning with the overthrow of Mossadegh in the 50s, um, interference in Iran's domestic affairs, the Shah of Iran, the Pahlavi Shah being a puppet, um, with the, his strings being pulled, um, the dependence on the whims of the, the American powers and how Iran was enslaved in a way. And so one of the main pillars of the Iran's revolutionary narrative is independence. And that comes up all the time. So if Iran is defiant when it came to the, the tanker or the drone crisis last year, that act of defiance is really the reiteration of its revolutionary narrative. So that's one. People themselves are neutral. I mean, if we think about when Javad Zarif signed the JCPOA, when he came back to Iran, just the images of him in the, in the airport, I mean, it was like he was, you know, Ronaldo, 
in Portugal or, you know, like he was a national hero that he had brokered this watershed deal and that relations were going to finally be mended after almost four decades. And this was massively important to the average Iranian. The average Iranian wants to be able to go to the United States, wants to be able to buy American products, is tired of the sanctions and doesn't have a, you know, a, 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 like an, an inherent um, dislike or disdain for Western culture or Western principles or Western values. That has been very much manufactured according to Iran's revolutionary policy, which is to kind of, you know, say, you know, well, it's kind of the West uh, has its you know, decadent um, cultural uh, norms and have nothing to do with us. So that's mostly caters to, again, the principles of the revolution and to uphold those values and to also by playing that up to maintain compliance to the, to the regime. So what I would say is that um, if we talk about the, just the attitude, just the feeling subjectively, I don't think there's an inbuilt hatred for Americans. Momentarily during the hostage crisis, there was this outburst. It was, you know, just getting rid of the shackles of foreign oppression and foreign imperialism and, and uh, you know, encroachment in Iran's domestic affairs and we've been enslaved, the third world rhetoric, that and all of the discourses, the theoretical discourses that we developed then, that's just one side of it. And I think that that cooled down a long time ago. Even when Rafsan Johnny was president and they started to reconstruct the economy after the Iran-Iraq war, I think then that whole idea of exporting revolution and creating an alternative model, that died down. And now it's just about pragmatic concerns. Iran, first and foremost, wants to relieve itself of sanctions at any cost. Now, at any cost comes with conditions. It doesn't mean humiliating itself. It doesn't mean um, being bossed around. So it has its red lines, but it does want to ease the sanctions because it has pragmatic, real politic interests, which is number one, ensuring the survival of the regime. And how can that be done if you have a, an economy that is breaking? Um, and, and you have you know, a population that is, on, that is living in, in the distress of the pressure of the sanctions and isolation and everything else. So ultimately they do want to, I think they do at the end, want to go back to negotiating, even though right now they might be heated and there's this conservative wave. I think ultimately they, they're not going to be vehemently anti-Western. It will just be a business deal and nothing more than that. So I wouldn't read into it more than that. And of course, it's going to try to maintain its dignity by saying that no, we won't cooperate, we won't negotiate right now. There'll be lots of rejections, but then ultimately they, they have to um, you know, balance things out and, and the sanctions are really uh, crippling Iran's economy and it's redu reduced. I mean, they say that yes, the manufacturing uh, sector has gone up in Iran, jobs have been created since these sanctions and the oil, uh, the oil revenue cuts. But the fact is that Iran relies on oil revenue and that needs to be reinstated. So I think um, that there's no anti-Americanism that's going to be ideologically keeping them away from brokering anything that's for national interest. Thank you so much. It was really so interesting question and so interesting answer. So now, dear colleagues, I move to our participants' question. Uh, please, before you uh, will ask your question, introduce your, yourself and remember that we are discussing only academic vision, not political, not another one. And if your question will be out of topic, uh, I will cancel it. Please, uh, Saleh, the floor is yours. Introduce yourself and after that you can ask a question. Just a minute, I will, uh, yeah, now you can speak. Please. Uh, first of all, Okay, just to present myself, my name is Saleh Seidli. I'm a second year master student here in Moscow, in Moscow State University. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture, uh, Madam Tazmini. Uh, my question is regarding Russian-Iranian uh, cooperation in Syria and even possible rivalry. Uh, probably are following events in Syria and lately uh, um, several Syrian high grant figures has been marginalized by the Syrian regime. For example, ex-Prime Minister Imad Hamiz, uh, ex-businessman uh, Typhoon um, Ran Makhlouf. Several Western and Arab uh, newsletters have characterized it as Russia's way to uh, counter Iranian influence in Syria. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's true or you think it's, or in your opinion, it's all speculation? Uh, 
Um, no, I don't think it's speculation. I think that the, uh, the Syrian um, theater is going to be a potential arena for clashes, most certainly. Um, I think that Russia really wants to reduce Iran's influence, particularly in the military and in the security structures, because there's an over-reliance. There's an over-reliance on um, pro-Iranian militias, and Russia perceives that as one of the main roadblocks um, of reforming uh, the army. And the army needs to be reformed because um, its combat uh, effectiveness has diminished over the years, and it needs to be upgraded. It needs, um, I don't know, everything from staffing and management and, and integrating. Ben Chahanom, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's something on your camera. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, so it definitely, and there's so many different articles that have been written about how um, Russia and Iran, this is the new um, sort of battlefield, and, and that after the civil war, we're going to see that real, uh, real motivations, the real objectives are, are going to start manifesting that. So uh, there's lots of issues. I mean, recently, uh, one Iranian, um, I think, I'm not sure if it was an MP, it was an MP, I think, that said that Syria should repay us, uh, pay us back for everything that we've done, and um, you know, to the amount of 10 to 20 billion uh, dollars that we've spent in treasure uh, in the past years. And there was another advisor, who was Khamenei's advisor, and he said the similar thing. He said uh, money should be returned to Iran in the form of oil, um, uh, gas, phosphate mines. Uh, so. The Iranians expect dividends, okay? And the reality is that lots of contracts have been signed um, between reconstruction contracts, uh, between Syria and Iran, but these contracts are not all falling into place. Some of the contracts have been, um, uh, Russia has an advantage over these contracts. It doesn't have the same financial constraints that Iran has, doesn't, al although the, the, the COVID pandemic is obviously going to put some financial constraint on, on all of the different dynamics. But there are going to be clashes in terms of reconstruction contracts. Uh, Russia has more ease, although Iran is in some form more embedded. Um, and the idea about what post, uh, post-war governance is, is going to look like. Iran is very used to having its militias and its pro-Iranian uh, groups that are not so integrated into one centralized, modernized system. And it prefers that format. But that's against what Russia wants. Russia wants to have something that's more centralized, something that is going to ensure also that uh, peace can be maintained. And one of the factors is that it needs a strong army. And a strong army, um, first of all, you need to, to, to remove the Iranian elements from it, which is going to be very hard to do, um, in order to, to create um, uh, a more independent, um, less Iranian dependent uh, Syrian army. So I think that just in terms of the vision that they have, there's definitely going to be some clashes. But again, I don't think they're going to turn their backs on each other. I don't think they're going to clash necessarily because of that. Um, it's definitely going to be an issue. But then again, we also have Turkey in the picture. Um, Turkey and Russia's dynamic being quite problematic. Um, one other thing is that just in terms of the role that Iran plays uh, internationally, uh, it is very keen on maintaining the Astana uh, format of the process. It wants to remain relevant. And I think that there's a little bit of fear when it comes to Syria and Turkey and, for example, Libya, uh, and that it sees that as a bit of a problem because what if they come to an agreement there? Does that strengthen their partnership? And will that, you know, manifest in Syria? Is it going to be less, um, will Iran be less pertinent? So um, I think that there is potential for clashes. And I'm not the first person to talk about it. There's a lot of people that say that this is potentially an area where there, there will be disagreements. But then again, those disagreements are real politic disagreements. It's over, again, um, reconstruction, um, governance, uh, you know, what is suitable for their own, what is more convenient for them. And so I don't think it's going to be anything that's going to shake that, that partnership. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Now I want to give floor to Alexei Hlebnikov. Alexei, are you with us? I'm sorry, just a minute. I will. Um, yes, Alexei, please. Hi, everyone. Um, Doctor Zmini, thanks for your insightful uh, presentation and uh, uh, answers to the 
questions of the participants. So I would like to jump into uh, a little bit different uh, topic for uh, more of a economic realm. Basically, we uh, all know that the economic foundation for Russian-Iranian ties is quite weak in comparison even to the Gulf states and especially in comparison to Turkey. So given that weak uh, economic basis and especially given the um, high pressure under which Iran is currently under and Russia as well, um, how do you see the prospects for the um, further development of this uh, basis and foundation? And uh, what are the chances, because there are a lot of speculations being here and there over the last years, that uh, Russia in comparison to Europe and the United States has way less to offer economically, financially, technologically to Iran mm -hmm. than again, th than Europe and the United States. And if there will be a chance for Iran to restore its relations with Europe or with the United States, it could easily sacrifice what have been already done uh, on its Russian track. So how do you assess these risks? So, and my second question, if you can... Hmm? Sure, can I just um, ask you, so uh, are you asking what um, the United States, if there is rapprochement, if there's some sort of renegotiation of the nuclear deal, how would that manifest on their partnership in terms of economics? Uh, okay, so it's you... Yeah, it's, maybe yeah. In, from this angle. And my second question, if I may um, uh, steal some more time, um, is about Iranian uh, Hormuz initiative. Yes. Uh, how, how do you assess it and what are the uh, prospects for its uh, implementation or even uh, evolution? It's hard to say that it will be implemented, but how it could potentially evolve and create a regional platform for at least some discussions to um, decrease the tensions in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with the Hormuz one. Um, well, Hormuz uh, peace plan um, is one that was um, offered by Rouhani. It is, again, about regional collective integrative security architecture for the Persian Gulf, is to create stability in the Persian Gulf. And um, it is a very attractive proposal. Now, the there are some things about this proposal. I mean, it's very similar to one that Russia proposed. I think it was last year, the collective security arrangement. I don't know what the title is, but Russia proposed a similar collective security system for the Persian Gulf. Um, so both of them are, are in agreement that such a, such a structure would be um, of use in that area. But there are certain um, issues that prevent this from happening because number one, we have, if Iran is going to engage with the GCC members or what is left of the GCC, then we'd have to assume that there's no intra-state um, or interstate conflict, and there is. Okay, so you know I won't get into it, but Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the the, the anti-terror quartet, and the you know I won't get into those details, but that in itself is one of the impediments to this because. Iran would have to assume that the party it's negotiating with or it's collaborating with is unified, and the GCC members are not unified by any stretch of the imagination. So that's the number one impediment, um, which is the sort of um, incoherence of, of, of the parties that would be members to such a, a multilateral collective uh, system. The other thing is that this hinges on number one, the United States not being involved in the region. And so the idea of the Homeless Peace Plan was really the bottom line was that this is, um, this, this is uh, predicated on the notion that the United States will not, in, will, not be, uh, will not be selling security. And what we know is that that's not going to happen. Yes, um, Saudi Arabia or the UAE, they do have fears that the United States um, is not going to step up if they are attacked after the uh, attacks of the oil facilities um, by the Houthis that they alleged Iran was involved in. You know, um, the United States didn't do much other than issue some warnings. Uh, and Russia also, you know, talked in, Iran, in Iran's favor by saying that there was no evidence that Iran had anything to do with those with those attacks. So they did feel insecure, 
and they are getting more insecure with all of these pronouncements that the United States is going to draw down, it's going, going to um, scale down its uh, presence in the, in the region militarily. So, um, but ultimately they, they will not forego a US partnership for one that might be brokered with Iran. It sounds great, but it's not going to because it just fundamentally clashes with all of the principles. But it's, it, it is, uh, again, what I said all, all along about Rouhani is that one of the first things he kept saying was the two things that were important to him, brokering a nuclear deal and also reestablishing dialogue with Saudi Arabia, with the Arab monarchies, um, and to be able to, to engage in something, some sort of... We've had, you know, some sort of shuttle diploma in a couple other countries regionally that get these parties to talk, but to no avail. And it doesn't issue rather that's all nonsense. Those are all instruments to further, you know, other real politic interests. Um, unless the United States withdrew, unless it fundamentally reconstituted its foreign policy, which it probably won't. Um, and the other thing, uh, your other question about uh, Iran and the US was about um, EU. Now, that's a good point because when the JCPOA was signed, one of the grievances that Russia had was that Iran quickly shifted to its European partners and preferred to work with them over, the, over Russia in terms of trade. And, you know, at that point, we saw that it wasn't Iran that was disposable or dispensable, it was Russia that was being disposed of because Iran always had an interest in fomenting better ties with, with Western European companies uh, and entities. So I think that, um, I think that pattern will continue. If there is another nuclear deal that's signed, if there's a new payment, uh, special payment vehicle, if, if there is uh, the ability to engage in trade, uh, to engage in, in sales of crude, um, which is Iran's lifeblood, if any of those possibilities arise, Iran will go for it. And that is why I say that Iran is not a pawn. This is a mutual relationship where they still, both parties are looking out for what is in their national interest. And that's why in a way, I think that the partnership is uh, balanced in that sense. Thank you so much, dear colleagues. Now uh, I want to give floor to our participants, Naim Hurmuz. Uh, he's a special representative of the Russian Trade and Economic uh, Development Council for interaction with Syrian Arab Republic. Uh, Naim, are you here? Hello. Hello, dear colleagues. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay. Hello, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Tazimini for your presentation, wonderful presentation. And uh, I thank you for the, all the participants and organizers for this to, to achieve this conference. Uh, my question, really, I had uh, two questions, but I used it to be one, because maybe that's a small time. I don't know. Maybe you haven't time. Uh, my question is: Is the relationship between the Russian Federation and the Islamic Republic of Iran a real partnership, or is it strategic alliance in the Middle East? Okay, thank you. Thanks I mean, so that's really been, thank, you. thank you very much. I mean, that's really been the, 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 what do you call it, the research question all along, which is how do you define this relationship? With all of the different angles that I've discussed, um, we, can say, we can see that we can't necessarily call it a strategic, in the classic sense of a strategic partnership entailing some sort of um, um, military. Um, Yes, it's okay. Um, right, so this is why I think that these two countries are aligned, and I prefer to use the term aligned. So I would say there's a Russian-Iranian alignment that is taking place that we see as a, as a permanent fixture in the Middle East. Now, as I've mentioned, for example, in the case of Syria, less in the case of Iraq or Yemen or Libya. I mean, Iran does have much involvement, but what we see in particular, which is going to be a test case, 
in Syria, for example, is that, um, or even in, for example, Russia's engagement with the Arab monarchies, which is very different, um, or Russia's partnership or relationship with Israel, uh, that will not impinge on this partnership. They both need each other. Um, I just mentioned Israel. There's a lot of speculation that, you know, there's a lot of resentment, let's say, that, for example, I think it was in 2016 when um, Iran bases were, or Iran um, forces in Syria were hit by the Israelis. The Iranians were very upset about this. They said that Russia hadn't shown any empathy um, and that Russia was responsible for the air system and had these advanced missile um, uh, defense systems and it hadn't activated these systems uh, to fend off the Israeli attacks on, on the Iranian um, supportive forces or Iran forces there. And that uh, this was just showing that Iran was, that Russia was, you know, two-faced or duplicitous. Russia has interests with, um, with Israel that are cultural. There's a lot of migration. There's, I think there's about $5 billion in trade just last year, um, lots of tourism. Uh, Israel is also a gateway to Iran's, uh, to, to Russia towards the West, um, giving access to, uh, what, Russia access to Western military technology and sophisticated West, Western weapon systems. So that is one dynamic. And then there's the oil diplomacy that we had before this recent spat with Saudi Arabia. And that, you know, they had this thing called, um, I think it was the OPEC plus, and then they called it this eternal marriage. And then it, you know, what we saw was this horrible price cutting war. Um, there's different uh, concentric circles, I would say, in this, in this bigger picture. And all of these, these different um, uh, arenas have their own dynamics. And there are clashes and conflicts and different partners that are rivals, adversaries, or antithetical towards Iran or towards, uh, less towards Russia. But the fact is that these two countries maintain this partnership. Uh, and that's why, again, you can call it a partnership, you can call it an alignment, but I think it's something that we can count on in the future. I don't think, unfortunately, it can make miracles. Um, it would be great to say that, yes, with the US scaling back in the region, there's going to be a void and, Rus and Russia's gonna come in and it's going to finally play that role uh, as mediator and it's going to be the you know, neutral arbiter that's going to balance and smooth things out between feuding and warring parties and that's the that's a narrative that it, it has and that it would the role that it would like to, to play but i don't think that that's going to happen anytime soon there's a great dependence on the united states unfortunately um and that is what's created this constant um that that, that feeds these other kinds of alignments or these interorders and other regional arrangements from um feeds them rather Thank you so much, Kancha Hanum, and thank you for your question, uh, dear Naim. So now, uh, I think, last question from our head of school, please, uh, Dr. Rushnikova, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Murat. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tasmin. It was very interesting, and your uh, presentation was very informative for us. Uh, I I know that it's, uh, it 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 doesn't easy uh, it doesn't so easy to answer such. Uh, difficult question uh, connected with politic, uh, politics and now I try to switch our conversation maybe in academic sphere, uh, I mean uh, in edu educational sphere because as I, uh, as, I had, uh, as I have said before, we, uh, cooperate, uh, we, uh, we have some cooperation with uh, Iran, uh, Tehran University and now we, uh, uh, we made a, a student's uh, work group. And uh, I know that you are a visiting fellow at the uh, Middle East Center, LSU University. And uh, maybe you know that uh, it is a strategic uh, partner of our university and we have a lot of uh, double degree programs uh, at, between uh, HSC University and LSU University in economics field, in computer field, and now in uh, international affairs. And one uh, of uh, this program, international dub, um, double degree program, international affairs, uh, is a re uh, a re uh, is um, um, uh, is realizing at our faculty. 
faculty of international affairs. And I have such, uh, such questions about the students. Uh, how many uh, Iranian students uh, do uh, study at LSU University and what programs uh, they, uh, do they prefer? Uh, I mean, what maybe special uh, pr profession they, do they prefer? Uh, and what um, instruments uh, does the British government uh, use uh, to involve uh, the Iranian students in social life? Uh, you know, maybe you know that the Russian government um, uh, per uh, permitted uh, to uh, to work uh, for international uh, students at the, in Russia, uh, included Iranian students, and now uh, the international students can um, have an have an opportunity to study and work uh, to earn money. Uh, I think it's a um, good uh, uh, good instrument to involve in social life uh, the international students in our country. And uh, I, uh, we connected with your center, uh, with Middle East Center, with uh, Sandra Sphere, and uh, she explained us that uh, your center, uh, your center, uh, don't doesn't work with the students, but have a lot of research uh, projects. And uh, could you explain maybe uh, the main or, or um, the, the the main projects and the field of research uh, uh, in? Uh, uh, in Iran, what what projects do you have with Iran, and maybe what uh, fields do you prefer when you uh, research the Iran? Thank you. Oh, okay, so that's a very interesting question um, because it's you know something a bit lighter <laughs> than Middle Eastern politics. Um, yes. <laughs> so, um, well, we have a, a, a great um, associate professor who is a professor of international history, who is called Roham Al-Bandi, and he teaches uh, Iranian history. Um, he is, has been there, I think, for quite a few years, and um, we look at him as a, as a pillar, um, as the anchor, and the um, sort of, the, sort of um, I'd say, kind of uh, advocate for Iranian studies. Um, so... This, the, the different students or scholars that I've met um, have been interested quite diversely. So we have another associate professor um, who is studying, who is doing gender studies. Uh, for example, she did this fantastic book about, um, she just launched the book, uh, I think a few months ago, um, about women in Iran and their, their, their different, you know, all, everything about, about their different sorts of um, uh, the limitations that they have, the opportunities that they have, the kind of exposure that they have. So, I mean, it's quite broad and it was very balanced. And so we have an interest in gender studies. There's, um, there's an, another researcher who's doing a study on Iran-Oman relations, historical relations. She's also at the Middle East Center. She also teaches. Um, we have other students that I've met who are doing, uh, who do masters, lots of on economics. Um, I would also say that we do have a Persian society at the LSE and they've been quite active. Uh, they approached me and a couple other scholars to do a talk, but unfortunately because of the pandemic it was cancelled. But a couple of years ago they themselves put together a small conference to talk about international, the, the effect of sanctions um, and Iran's economic landscape. And so they brought in some experts. So they're also active and they really want to get um, give Iran exposure. So they reached out to me and um, another colleague of mine who is also doing another history project. So this other colleague of mine is doing ancient history. So a lot of emphasis on history, some economics, gender studies. Um, what else would I say? Well, in terms of politics, we're going to have another research fellow who's going to be specializing on the nuclear issue. Really, the Middle East Center is expanding uh, on Iranian studies, uh, and it's one of the, the, the pledges that it has to, to support Iranian students. So, um, I myself, um, you know, my research is domestic, international affairs of Iran. I've also I also do a history project on Iran. So there is a lot of um, support now in terms of uh, financing students. That's a bit of a problem. Of course, Iran is unable to create any sort of grants or any, you know, project um, that it can support because of the sanctions and because of all the hundreds of different uh, kind of um, procedures it would have to go through in order to, to get that money to the university. So 
you can definitely see that the lack of funding also inhibits the development of scholarship on Iran because uh, there are students that, um, or there are scholars that want to do higher education, they want to do research projects on Iran, uh, but they are not funded. So that is a bit of a, that, that there is a discrepancy between that support for Iranian students and, you know, other areas. And that's got to do a lot with the, the political situation of the country, of course. But there's always this mission to continue fostering Iranian studies. Um, you know, of course, there would, there, there would be interest in maybe doing a master's program on Iranian studies, which would be nice to do at the LSC. There's always interest in it. Uh, but the Middle East Center itself is mostly focused on um, the politics, on, on Iraq, on Kuwait, on the, uh, on the Arab monarchy. So it's more focused there, um, which they've balanced out with me being there. And they've got some other students that are focusing uh, on Iran that are um, affiliated as well. Uh, in terms of numbers, I'm not sure. I would say not as many Iranians that I saw, let's say, at, at SOAS. SOAS definitely, because they have a master's program in Iranian studies and that they have area studies, there's more of an interest. It, at LSE, it's the big disciplines. So either, I would just say just broadly economics, history. Um, I also think I, I, there are a couple of people in different centers, research centers, but in terms of departments, I would say mostly history and economics. Thank you so much, Kanchi Hanum. So, dear colleagues uh, and uh, Kanchi Hanum, I think it's time to sum up because we this our discussion long about 90 minutes. It's so much, but uh, it was so interesting. And first of all, Kanchi Hanum, hey, le memnun. Uh, uh, so, dear colleagues, it's time to sum up. Uh, and as I said always, the key aim of our seminars is to get information from primary sources. And today we have this opportunity thanks to Dr. Gönce Tazmini. One more time, I want to express my gratitude to, your, to you for accepting our invitation and for your overwhelming speech, for your comprehensive answers to our question. Hope we will continue our fruitful cooperation with you. Uh, as you see, we are so happy to interact with you because uh, you are a real, uh, how to say, great specialist. And it's important for us because we are so interesting in specialists like you. So as I said, uh, our video record of this event will be available in 10 days maybe on the School of International Regional Studies official YouTube channel. Uh, one more time, I want to thank our special guests, uh, Professor Andrei Baklanov, uh, our friends Adlan Margoev, Farhad Ibrahimov, Nikita Smagin, Alexey Hlebnikov. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you to be with us and our participants for their interesting question. I hope, Don uh, Hanum, you also, um, what to say, I'm sorry. So I hope that uh, this discussion was really interesting for you too, because I'm really enjoying it. And dear colleagues, one more time, thank you so much. If you want to add something, please, you can do it. You can turn on your microphones. And I just say thank you very much for the invitation to speak. It's great to share my research. Um, and the discussion has been very fruitful. And also um, the feedback that I'm getting in terms of uh, the questions show the different areas that um, I will develop on and uh, research further. Um, and also thank you for the special guests listening in and the participants and, of course, um, uh, Dr. Vera and Mr. Araye Mora. Yes, <laughs> uh, thank you so much uh, for reaching out. It's been a real pleasure. I appreciate it. I hope to do this one day in person because this whole Zoom setup is new to me and I'm not a big, I'm more of a fan of, you know, person to person, real life. Uh, engagements rather than this. But we really hope that in future, inshallah, as Arab says, uh, we will uh, meet with you in Moscow and you will be our guest, our special guest. And I think uh, Professor Vishniko will support me in this idea. Yeah. Yes? Thank you very much for joining us today. Yes, it was really interesting and it was a new stream in our, our online seminar and uh, in our cooperation. Thank you, dear colleagues, that you was with us today.